Okay, next part of the scapulothoracic joint we'll talk about are the muscles and nerves. Objective one for muscles, describe the scapulothoracic muscles and their actions. And two, the nerves, identify the nerves that innervate the muscles that will act on the scapulothoracic joint and cause those movements. But before we begin, let's talk about one thing. Here's the right scapulothoracic joint from a superior view, and in yellow, there's that scapulothoracic joint. And then in green is the clavicle, orange is the scapula, and purple is the humerus, where the upper limb is hanging. And that blue arrow points to the sternoclavicular joint. And the sternoclavicular joint is the only bony attachment attaching the upper limb to the axial skeleton. So that begs the question, how is the scapulothoracic joint, and hence the upper limb, supported if there's only that one little joint attaching it to the axial skeleton? The answer is scapular sling muscles, with a key emphasis on that word sling, because the word sling is a flexible strap used to support or raise a weight. And in the case of this joint, a flexible strap is the scapular sling muscles, and it's used to support or raise a weight, and in this case, the weight is the upper limbs. Okay, so here we have the scapular sling muscles from trapezius down to the subclavius. We're going to focus on the traps, levator, rhomboids, and serratus, not so much in the pec minor subclavius. So let's start with the trapezius muscle. Here we have a, a posterior and anterior view of the trapezius muscle, and the yellow arrow shows part of the origin, which is the external occipital protuberance, and then the muscle attaches all on that nuchal ligament down to the C7 vertebra, and then from C7 all the way down the spinous processes to T12. Then the muscle attaches more laterally all along that spine of the scapula to the acromion, and then also along that lateral third of the clavicle. So they're the attachments of the trapezius muscle. And so when we look at now the orientation of the muscle fibers, they're really kind of cool and unique. So there's that blue dot represents the attachments of the muscle fibers to the acromion and clavicle, and those fibers all course in an upward direction to the occipital bone. So therefore, when this muscle contracts, it's going to elevate the scapula, as in shrugging your shoulders. Now, when we now take a look at the attachments along the middle of the spine of the scapula, and those uh, orientations, fibers, course more horizontally, in a sense, when we look at the way these muscle fibers contract, they more adduct the scapula, moving it towards the midline in that fashion. And then finally, um, the... Uh, the orientations from the spine of the scapula by the medial margin just go down and they help to depress the scapula. Okay, now let's look at all these orientation fibers that come from the lateral third of the clavicle, the acromion, mid spine, and medial margin spine, and then look at those orientation fibers together. Watch this. Shing. Look at that different orientation. So when all these muscle fibers contract at the same time, they result in an upward rotation of the scapula in this fashion. So as if holding your arms horizontal and then you lift your hands above your head. Look at that, the way those fibers course. And as in reaching for a shelf, a plate on the top shelf. There we have the trapezius. Now the trapezius muscle is innervated by the spinal accessory nerve or cranial nerve 11, XI. And the spinal accessory nerve courses down from the jugular foramen and deep to the trapezius in this fashion. We look in the lateral view, uh, the yellow arrow shows its uh, origin along the more rostral part of the spinal cord. The nerve goes up through the foramen magnum with the spinal cord, but then jets back down through the jugular foramen and then innervates the sternocleidomastoid and the trapezius muscles. Okay, let's now go a little bit deeper. We'll outline the trapezius. We're going to take a scalpel and go, Hacha! and we're going to cut away the trapezius, and now we have the deeper muscles, the levator scapulae muscle, which attaches to the transverse process of the uh, upper cervical vertebrae, and then it inserts on the superior angle of the scapula, and as its name implies, when this muscle contracts, it will levate or elevate the scapula in this fashion.
helping shrug the shoulders with the trapezius. Now, the rhomboid minor attaches to the spinous processes of C1, C7 and T1, and it goes to the medial margin of the scapula right by that spine. Uh, the, the rhomboid major attaches from T2 down to T5, and then it inserts along the medial margin of the scapula. And so collectively, the rhomboid minor and rhomboid major muscles will adduct or retract the scapula in that fashion. Okay, what about innervation of the, these three muscles? So there in red, we have levator scapulae, purple rhomboid minor, and orange, the rhomboid major. And now what we'll do is let's look at the nerve that innervates these muscles, which is the dorsal scapular nerve, or C5. So look at the picture, and we see this nerve deep to those muscles that sends branches to all three of them. Now, how do we get from the C5 neurological level to these muscles? So let's now look beside that innervation and look, we see a cross-section of the C5 spinal cord level. And because the dorsal scapular nerve is motor, causing muscle to contract, look in the ventral horn gray matter. There we have the cell body. Now follow the axon out the ventral root and ventral ramus going over to make that dorsal scapular nerve. There we have it. There's our dorsal scapular nerve. Now, one other thing to add to this is that the because these muscles are upper limb muscles, they're part of the brachial plexus. So there we have that brachial plexus, which is the, the ventral rami from C5 through T1, and the dorsal scapular nerve is part of it. So as you learn to trace out the brachial plexus, this is where the dorsal scapular nerve sits in that plexus. Okay, so next we have the next scapular sling muscle is the serratus anterior muscle. And it gets its name because its origin, which shown in this yellow arrow, all long ribs one through eight, looks a serrated appearance, like a serrated knife. And then the insertion courses back all along the medial margin of the scapula on its anterior surface. So it helps to uh, in, that, in that area. All right, now let's look at this muscle again now in a cross section from a superior view. All right. That arrow shows its origin along the ribs, then it courses and attaches to the ventral surface of the medial margin of the scapula. And so when this muscle contracts, watch how it abducts or protracts the scapula. But also notice because of its attachment to the medial margin, the muscle contracts and that arrow shows the vector pulling the scapula towards the rib cage. Therefore, yeah, towards the rib cage. All right, now, Here's the serratus anterior muscle and its innervation, which is the long thoracic nerve, which comes from the C5 to C7 spinal cord levels. Um, to do that, let's take a look at C5, C6, and C7 cross sections of the spinal cord. This is a motor nerve. So again, look in the ventral horn gray matter. There's where the cell bodies come. And now watch how at each level, the nerve exits the ventral root into the ventral ramus, all the way down, forming that long thoracic nerve, which then goes on the superficial or external surface of the serratus anterior to innervate it. That's what makes this muscle a little bit unique, where most nerves go on the deep surface. This nerve's on the external surface, makes it very prone to injury. Um, notice now that the brachial plexus that we ghost in there, that brachial plexus again from C5 to T1 for all the nerves that go to the upper limb, this is where the long thoracic nerve sits in that plexus. Now to clinically test this serratus anterior muscle and its accompanying long thoracic nerve, have the patient put their hands along the wall as if you're like saying, hey, stick them up and then have them push against the wall and you notice how that scapula wings out. It's called a wing scapula and it does this because notice that uh, if you cannot have the muscle contract because it's paralyzed, usually due to long thoracic nerve injury, when you push, that scapula wings out, and that's what results in a winged scapula. Okay, pectoralis minor, uh, it's located in the pectoral region or the breast region, and it's smaller than the pec major. Um, it arises from ribs three, four, and five, and then it inserts on that coracoid process. It helps stabilize the scapulothoracic joint, helps to um, uh, downwardly rotate the scapula and protract it, but clinically it's not that relevant, so long as you can recognize it, it's good. Same with the subclavius muscle. It comes from rib one to the bottom of the clavicle. Supports that. You can see it. Wonderful. It's got some surgical implications, but not so much um, from physical exam findings. So there we have our scapular sling muscles from trapezius down to serratus anterior with a focus on them. Now in conclusion, let's just take a look at the scapulothoracic joint from a superior view. 
And there we've got that scapular thoracic joint. And now let's lay on top the scapular sling muscles, the most superficial being the trapezius muscle, then deep to that, the rhomboid major muscle, and then along the ribs into the medial margin, the serratus anterior. And look at how all those muscles stabilize that scapular thoracic joint. And they all have a common attachment, which is the axial skeleton, vertebrae and ribs. And their common action, they function on the scapulothoracic joint.